about any other introduction. Let's give Paul a hand. Okay, thank you, Jim. Yeah, uh, being a geologist, I see things a little different than probably many people that are involved with archaeology may, may see when they look at a ruin or an archaeological site. Uh, typically, I look for things that are a little out of the ordinary. For instance, if you find a, a quartzite boulder that is in an area of verde lake beds where all the rocks are soft, it clearly makes a difference. It came from somewhere. It was brought there. So tonight I'll talk a little bit about uh, some geological aspects that we find in our backyard going up onto the Colorado Plateau a bit. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my partner of 57 years here, Phyllis. Yeah. Uh, very supportive of what, what I keep doing. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you want to get, get the lights up? There's, there's a number of features that I think you'll find uh, fascinating here. Hopefully this. In the uh, Four Corners area, where the four states of Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Arizona come together, is sort of the focus of, of some of this talk. And prior to 1971, uh, we visited, like any, any other tourist, uh, visited all the national parks, Mesa Verde and so on. But since 1971, uh, when I was transferred to work at, in the Jerome area, uh, we began to get more and more involved with uh, archaeological sites. And uh, in the area we live in, the, this is a simple geologic map. This is the state map of Arizona. Uh, the Sedona Verde Valley area, uh, at the lower part, San Francisco Peaks in the middle and the Grand Canyon at the top. In general, as you're going in these rocks, you're going from older rocks down where you see the brown color on the bottom, uh, Precambrian rocks that are almost two billion years old. You move up onto the, to the plateau, the blue colored rocks would be Paleozoic rocks that would be up as young as, as 250 million years old. And then things like the San Francisco peaks are literally born yesterday. San, the Sunset Crater erupted about the time that the Battle of Hastings was fought less than 2,000 years ago. So we have a, a, quite a variety. And when we look at the traditional concepts of how natives got into North and South America, as the waning stages of the last ice age, you had uh, both a, a corridor between the Cordilleran Ice Age and the big Laurentide Ice Sheet uh, that extends clear up into Greenland today. And uh, it probably also had uh, routes along the coast where people uh, traveled by boat down, but certainly by something like 12,000 years ago, uh, natives had, had gone clear to t Tierra del Fuego in, in the southern part of South America. So the, the people moved around and uh, they moved rather rapidly. Uh, when we look at uh, some of these ancient projectile points, uh, this is at a time when this is about all that's left. Uh, we don't have much in the way of any hard uh, building sites. They had temporary shelters. Uh, but the Clovis and Folsom points have been found in Mastodon and Bison Kills. Uh, if you were here as recently as 15,000 to maybe 11,000 years ago, this might have been a scene here in the Verde Valley. The megafauna that you see in this picture are now entirely extinct. If you go to the La Brea Tar Pits in downtown Los Angeles, you will see remains of Mastodon, giant bear, the, the giant sloth, the camel. Even the horse was here. They all went extinct. It wasn't until the Spaniards lost horses and the Indians took up the challenge and uh, began to breed their own horses that we have horses back in North America. 
Mastodons were more common in the lower 48 states, and they're smaller than the main mammoth, which is found typically further north. And the dentition is quite different. So if you see uh, the, the grinding tooth of the mammoth, you, you can see it, that it's a very flat tooth, whereas the mastodon tooth, which would have been in this area here, you see that there's a lot more of a uh, dentition sticking up. Uh, in Vernal, Utah, if you ever get up there, you want to see the reconstruction of a mastodon. Uh, that's me trying to get out of the way. <laughs> and in our own Ver Verde Valley here, there are mastodon tracks, plus uh, other tracks that are some kind of an ungulate. Uh, the late Harvey Neininger, the meteorologist or the uh, meteorite expert, back in the 30s, excavated some lion tracks right up in here. Lion tracks that had five to six inch pads, so these were very large animals. Uh, to photograph them, we put in a little water to show you the depression. And if you go up above Montezuma Castle, you can see more of these uh, tracks in, a, in soft travertine. Now, this is my field of expertise is in, in uh, mining geology. And I've worked all over uh, North America, Alaska, Canada, some in South America, and a little bit in Australia, and so on. But Jerome is of particular interest. And uh, what's particularly fascinating about this is that as you look down into where the, the open pit is in the United Verde mine, that was a site that uh, Native Americans had, had quarried pigments, both iron oxide and copper oxide pigments. And uh, off in the distance, you can see the San Francisco peaks. Uh, Sedona would be over in here, the Verde Valley in between. We'll be talking a little bit more about that. But the reason for showing you this picture is that uh, the Spanish explorers came here because they had heard about the the Hopi mines, so-called, and they were searching for their El Dorado and their cities of gold. And they came to where the discovery site is, where you see the star, on May 8th, 1585. It's a long time back. So this is one of the first incursions of the Spaniards into this part of the world. And they came specifically looking for gold. All they found was worthless copper. So they left the next day. But this is an example of some of the things that you find in the oxidized cap rock of Jerome. Uh, the green is, is uh, malachite. Uh, the blue is azurite, azure blue. Uh, this is native copper with a patina of, uh, of malachite on it. And you see iron oxide in the bottom here, which is uh, can, can be anywhere from yellow to orange to red, and so on. When I was mapping early on in Jerome, we did a lot of uh, field work. Down below Jerome, about a mile down, I found in the Tapete sandstone, just above the Great Unconformity, where the base of the Paleozoic rocks, I found these two rock matates. One was exposed. This is the other one right here. I later dug that out and checked it out. And right up in this region right in here were bits and pieces of, of malachite and azurite that had been ground or were being ground by the Native Americans. But what fascinated me is that sitting there, if you imagine two hands grinding in, in, these, in these rock matates, the center line aims right at Tuzigut Monument. So this is a very special little place. Quick look at, at the geology of this area. We've got uh, the Precambrian rocks down below, the Great Unconformity that's about a separating about a, a one and a quarter billion years between the older rocks and the younger rocks of the Paleozoic era. Uh, the rocks on the left are what you would find in the Grand Canyon. The rocks that we see above Sedona would be these rocks here. 
And because of the tilt of the land, we see these rocks over on the Jerome side of the valley. So if you add Jerome to Sedona, it's basically the same thing as the Grand Canyon. There are slight differences. And what's happening is that during this entire time of deposition, the land is subsiding, very much like New Orleans is today. And so all of the blue colorations are indicating limestone formed in shallow water. Uh, when, when these rocks were being laid down on the Tapit sandstone, we were way south of the equator. And as, as, we're, as North America is drifting northward, during the time of the Redwall limestone, a very important aquifer in the Sedona area, we were sitting at the equator. By the time, at, at the end of the Paleozoic era, when the great mass extinction took place 250 million years ago, we were well north of the equator. So we've been uh, on the move for a long time here. In uptown Sedona, this is a, a stratigraphic column showing some of the rock types we have in town. Town of Sedona is built on the Hermit Formation. This is a soft unit, as you'll soon see. We have hard rocks up above it that are cliff-forming rocks. And if you go up by where Midgley Bridge is located, you're on solid rock again. So when you view West Sedona, you can see this big flat bench upon which the city is built. And that's built on the Hermit Formation. And it's a, it's a very relatively soft rock with cliffs up above it. It's a very unique setting for a town. And when you look at the Hermit Formation in a road cut, this is a, a road cut near where the present day uh, Sedona High School would be. When they first widened the road back in the 70s, they had to blast this. And a year later, it's all falling apart. So the Hermit Formation would not make a good uh, structural material for building a, a, a wall in an archaeological site. But you get up in, into the cliff forming rocks and you see uh, big massive sandstones, the Schneble Hill Formation and uh, Coconino Sandstone and so on. They're very uh, durable rocks. A typical uh, ruin in the Sedona area and all through the American Southwest you'll have these, these strange undercuts where the Indians built their dwellings. And if you see this white zone through here, that's what we call caliche, it's, it's calcium carbonate. It's what makes water hard. If you want an experiment uh, in your local drinking water, take a tumbler of, uh, a glass tumbler from your kitchen, fill it with ice cubes, let the ice cubes melt, and you'll see a little film of white on the bottom. There's that much dissolved calcium in the water that's coming through. And so when you have water that is freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing, freezing and thawing, it tends to spall out these undercuts. And that's what makes uh, that little uh, kind of a weeping zone where water is coming out make it more common. A lot of things you'll see are not man-made. These are, are natural arcuate fractures, we call a conchoidal fracture. Uh, up on West Twin Buttes, looking off toward uh, the chapel area, this picture was taken back in the 70s, late 70s. Uh, it's all chock-a-block full of houses now. Uh, you're looking off at Cathedral Rock. Here's Jerome in the distance. In between is a big Verde Valley filled with young lake beds. And to show you a little bit of the history of this, when the land was first raised up here back about 70, 75 million years ago, during what we call the Laramide orogeny, North America was sliding westward. The East Pacific rise was moving eastward. The two collided and raised the landscape. So this would be uh, the site of where Jerome would be. This would be the site of where Sedona would be. Here's, here's Oak Creek Fault. Anyway, during this time, the land was uplifted, and if you continued over to the left of this toward Prescott, Prescott would have been much higher than modern-day Flagstaff. And for the next 50 million years, you eroded this landscape off with streams heading toward the plateau. 
They were later covered with 10 to 15 million year old basalt lava flows that are shown in gray. And underneath that is gravel channels that are carrying material from the Prescott area onto the modern day Colorado Plateau. About 10 million years ago, the crust of the earth in Western North America was beginning to migrate eastward and we have what's called the basin and range extension. So all the way from uptown Sedona, clear to the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, the land has been pulled apart and dropped and stretched. So we, in the process of making this depression, we call this a graben or a rift valley. And it's filled in with lake beds a Montezuma Castle and Montezuma Well would be built in these lake beds that were once at this level here. So we have the rocks, the Precambrian rocks over in the Jerome side. They're well underneath the Sedona area. So that monocline that you see there is what makes the, the rocks, the younger rocks preserved in the Sedona area and exposed in the, in the, in the uh, Jerome area. Looking down at uh, the Verde Lake beds, this was uh, from a hot air balloon. <laughs> uh, you can see the Verde Lake beds, all freshwater limestones, if you will. There's so much lime that is being eroded out of the cliffs. This is uh, Verde Lake beds up close in Wikiup Canyon, just uh, east of Camp Verde. Uh, in the southern part of, of around Camp Verde, you had both gypsum beds and evaporite salt. This is like table salt. So this is a very common trade item to the Native Americans. Salt was worth its weight in gold and they could, they could transport that all over as a trade item. Uh, one of the, the recent things that uh, is of interest to me is this uh, model that the Oak Creek uh, Watershed Council has made this shows the, the outline of the Oak Creek watershed coming down from Flagstaff, down through Sedona to its outlet where it joins the Verde River. And the reason for talking about water is that water is key in this area. We've got a lot of uh, dry valleys. We do have Oak Creek, of course, coming down through Sedona and coming down, but all of the blue arrows are, are water that are passing through the subsurface in caves in the Redwall limestone. And uh, they don't pop through until you're down by Page Springs down here, where you have Spring Creek, uh, Lolomai Springs, Bubbling Springs, Page Springs. And the, what is interesting is that that water is coming out of, uh, even though it is, is coming through as artesian water at this point in space, its oxygen isotope tells us that it was born at elevations of 6,800 feet or higher, which means that this is water being transported from the San Francisco peaks. And so what happens is that on the plateau, we're, we're recharging both as snow and rainfall. If you look at the cliffs around us today after our heavy rains, you'll see where the water is just glistening on the banks. Uh, this is a big storage basin. Sandstones are very porous and they hold a lot of water. So water is infiltrating and moving through these, these cave systems in the, in the Redwall limestone and popping through as artesian springs on a big graben fault over here near, near the Page Springs area. Uh, Bubbling Springs is, is a very big outlet. And the reason for showing these is that this was the site of, of a lot of Indian ruins. Uh, they had ready access to water. They could irrigate crops, uh, lolomice, and a lot of, when the Anglos came, they occupied places that are off limits to a lot of archeologists today. So there's a lot of sites along the, uh, these springs where there, there were probably a lot more sites than we're aware of. We'll take a quick look at some of the archeological sites on the Colorado Plateau. Uh, some of the more famous ones, Mesa Verde and, and the Cliff Palace area, uh, the beautiful tower with, with the round uh, outline. 
uh, go to Keith Seal. Uh, I don't know how many in this audience have been to Keith Seal. It's a long hike in, but it's, it's well worth it if you ever had the chance. We went in many years ago and camped here. And you'll notice, again, these, these undercut areas where there's a soft layer that creates the cavity, just like you see over here. There's a softer spot. And so you begin forming these arches that work their way back. And you get freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw every night in the wintertime, and it helps these things to spall. A little out of focus, but Bitotican Ruin is a classic. One of these huge alcoves. Years ago, I was flying in an airplane over this part of the world at about 40,000 feet in a commercial airliner. And this stood out as a, like a sore thumb. You could see it very, very plainly. Chaco Canyon is, is a neat place. Uh, what is interesting is that on the back wall of this cliff here, uh, the Native Americans had recognized that, the, that a big chunk was ready to come down. And so they built uh, stone pillars underneath there to try to reinforce it. The Park Service back then was hurting for money just like it is now. And uh, the, the recommendations were to stabilize that before it fell in. But in January 1941, it collapsed and buried this part of the ruin. Uh, looking down at uh, Chaco Canyon or Pueblo Bonito, you can see the Chaco Wash out in the beyond. Uh, many archaeologists claim that uh, because the wash deepened and, and uh, the water table dropped, that that's the reason for abandonment. I just don't buy that. People who were skilled enough to make these engineering wonders uh, were skilled enough to make a simple dam here. Uh, I don't believe that's the reason. I think there were other reasons, uh, non-geological, that created the uh, collapse of uh, an abandonment of, of uh, Chaco Canyon. One of the things that you see here, I lost a, a series of photographs a few years back, uh, and this is the only one I could, I could resurrect, but you'll see very unusual places where the walls have, have caved in. Some of them defy logic. In some places, uh, it's obvious that stream erosion undercut the bank and they rebuilt the walls. So the walls were tipping over and then they rebuilt it. Uh, go to Canyon de Chez and you can see the White House ruin, a very small ruin in the alcove. There's the plane of weakness. And these are manganese stains that are coming down. Uh, you see down in the canyon bottom a larger Pueblo, so most of the people were living in the bottom. Uh, it's probably quite likely that the elite were living up in the more pristine location. Hole in the rock near Wapatki is a, is a fascinating place. You can see in the lower left picture, you're, you're on a monocline. This, a monocline is a one-sided fold. And uh, if you look at the top picture, uh, th these holes in the wall, it's hard to know when they reconstruct the, the, the walls whether these are actually true to the initial wall, but that's at the end of that wall right there. These were probably archaeological uh, astronomical sites. Uh, we happened to be there when the moon, full moon came up, and uh, you're looking out through one of the the doorways looking off to the east. There are all kinds of uh, nearby petroglyphs that, are, that must have something to do with, with uh, astronomical sightings. Uh, maybe Ken can, in, can enlighten us on this a little bit later. Uh, up near Comwash, Utah, there's some, again, right along a cliff uh, face. Uh, there's a stream bed underneath here. Some of this is sand dune deposits. But again, the, the preference is to build under these alcoves. Uh, just north of Bluff, Utah, you can see uh, sandstone cliffs, uh, alternating hard and soft. Usually there's clay layers in these soft spots, a little harder sandstone, alternating hard and soft, and then a big cap of, of uh, 
hard sandstone. But if you look close, you can see a ruin here. Uh, we, we visited this site several years back. Great place to get away from it all. In the Grand Canyon, uh, where they probably didn't have to worry about any enemies coming at them, uh, here's the Colorado River coming down through Unkar Rapids. This is Unkar Creek coming down, and on the delta, that's a, a giant Indian ruin. This is the largest Indian settlement in the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Now we look locally at some of our sites. And again, you get into the Coconino Sandstone at Walnut Canyon, and not only did they take advantage of these uh, uh, undercut areas, but by building the walls up, they're actually strengthening the top to prevent it from collapsing. So uh, it, it, it serves a dual purpose. Uh, Montezuma Castle, of course, built on Verde lake beds. These are very soft. But as long as it's protected by a little bit harder layer on the top, uh, these undercut areas uh, have a nice south-facing view. And it's very likely that some of that soft rock was, was cut out, excavated by human hands. Uh, the, the, the ruin is not very deep, but it's, it's multi-storied. Uh, one of your field trips coming up will go to the Mindeleff Cavettes. Now this is down in the soft Verde Lake beds. And again, you have a, a harder layer up here which is protecting this bank. The Cavettes are all along here. There are just probably hundreds of them. And these are combinations of both natural and human dug. Uh, I was fascinated with this view of one of the undercuts because you can see uh, the natural opening here, and there's a soft layer that is, that is weathering out, kind of just falling apart. Uh, we have a, a word for this in geology. Everything decrepitates with time. It's something we can all relate to. <laughs> but if you look carefully up, and when you're at Mendeleev Caves, look up at, these, at the back. You're looking up at the base of a stream bed. Those are cobbles of, you can see them up in here. That's the base of a stream bed of, of tearing up harder parts of, of the uh, Verde Lake beds, freshwater limestone. So you're looking at the bottom of an old uh, river channel cut into the lake beds. Tuziwut, of course, has been totally rebuilt. But they had the sense of building on the mound and using the flat land for agricultural purposes, unlike uh, modern uh, real estate developers. <laughs> Go to Palatki, and you see the cliff dwellings on the, on the south-facing slope. But if you look carefully beyond some of the ruins, you'll see another one of these uh, zones that helps to create an undercut. And as water moves outward, uh, it, it, again, it freezes, freezes and thaws. So if you think of our, our weather up in this part of the world, just about every night for many months in the wintertime, it'll freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze and thaw. You keep spalling that off, whereas you have harder rock above and harder rock below. So given enough time, it'll make that alcove in which you have a ruin built. Sacred Mountain is sitting on lake beds. Those are Birdie Lake beds on top of Schnebley Hill Formation, which is just popping out in a little bit of outcrop. Uh, in, inside of Montezuma Well, you can see uh, the ruins on the far wall. When, when Montezuma Well was first built, none of this collapse had taken place. Water was issuing out on the top surface. And if you've ever been to Havasu Canyon, I don't have a picture of Havasu, but right up here where you stand and look into the, the, into the dwelling, you'll see little uh, arcuate uh, places where the travertine is building up. Water was issuing from the very top of this surface up here and, and spilling out as a dome. This is a travertine dome built of calcium carbonate. 
So where, where we were looking was at this rim of that dome. The bigger dome is about a mile across, and many people don't even realize it exists. But it's, it's uh, far bigger, and so the original dome was, was centered pretty much where the, the modern well is located. But as the well is beginning to eat out the lower part, it collapsed. And again, just like uh, at, at Page Springs, you've got caves down in the Redwall limestone. And when they meet a uh, Graben fault, they, they emerge. The water table is, is right up here. So under, under pressure, it's coming down from high on the plateau and popping up as an artesian spring. Just south of where we live, uh, we live over in Broken Arrow, and the Cathedral of the Holy Cross is just on this side of West Twin Buttes. Right up here is a ruin site. Uh, Jim Graceffa helped me uh, several years back. We mapped this site up on top of the mountain. Uh, there was uh, seven conti contiguous rooms here, and one isolated room, and a little plaza. These were sighting points. They had to be built uh, for special hilltop site purposes. And I was always puzzled as to exactly what was going on here. So as you will see a little bit later, I, I visited this site on June 21st of one year to see if it had any astronomical significance. When you go up into the upper part of the Verde River, you see an entirely different kind of a uh, dwelling site. Uh, there was a, a historic ranch down in the bottom of the valley where they had water. And uh, there, you, you can go up there and you can find potsherds all over the place and debitage of chipped chert and so on. Uh, there were obviously Native Americans living down in the valley bottom, but they must have had enemies because up on the hillside, here's part of a wall, you see these rather crude buildings both at the Molly G and uh, Morgan sites. Uh, here you can see the wall built. There's hardly any rooms inside. See, these were probably refuges. So when they had enemies come in, they could, they could quickly go from the valley bottom up to these refuge sites. But in this particular one, uh, there were a few rooms. And if you see these, uh, rhyolite boulder or rhyolite slabs, they came from Sullivan Buttes up here. They were carried a long way. All of the rest of the wall is built of local basalt flow. So this was a special site. This may have been for a chief or somebody, somebody special. Uh, things like this are, are intriguing to me because they're out of place. They're not local. There were things that were brought in from a great distance to uh, make something very special. South of Camp Verde is another uh, called Brown Springs. It's a ruin. And you can see some of the club members up on top. This again is a big travertine dome. And this was, was uh, it would have been a site very much like uh, Montezuma Well before it collapsed. So uh, it leaves you to wonder, you know, if some of these sites such as this may have been occupied when it collapsed. So there's a lot of, a lot of unknowns that we, 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 we just don't know all the answers to. Now some archeological sites are very, very distinctive and are clearly related to some kind of a, a geologic feature or sacred location. And among them are sinkholes and blowholes possibly portals to the underworld, which is heavy in the uh, Native American myths. Up at Wapatki, you can see the classic Pueblo up on high ground. But if you move off to the, to the north, you can see a plaza. Must be a uh, elder hostel class or somebody here. And then down below is, a, is one of the furthest north ball courts. But where the arrow is pointing is a blowhole. And a blowhole is, it gets its name from the fact that 
you have a cave underneath in the, uh, in, the in this case, the Kaibab limestone, uh, a lot of airspace. So the ground, this would be a cross section. Here's the surface. This is at depth. Water table would be down in here somewhere. Even though these were carved by running water, the water table progressively dropped down and it's now filled with air cavity. So when you have a high pressure uh, coming in, uh, air will, will enter into the underground chamber. When you have a low pressure coming in, air will blow out. And these had to be important to the Native Americans as, as key connections to the underworld. Uh, at the time this picture was taken, there was a high pressure and air was going down. Uh, a few years back, I had the, the chance to bring a bunch of Texas students. They were all uh, grade school students. And it was a low pressure area moving in. This was roaring out of there like a jet engine. And picture about, uh, about 12, uh, 12 year old girls standing around with their hair standing straight up in the air. <laughs> this big outblast of air coming out. Near Wapatki is called the Citadel. And again, you see both the local sandstone and up on this uh, lava uh, remains up in here is a, is a large pueblo. If you go up there and you, you, you see these crude ruins, a combination of both basalt lava and sandstone, uh, nothing too sophisticated like you see in Chaco Canyon, but a clear view of San Francisco Peaks, which was sacred. And if you look to the south, you see this big sinkhole. Uh, this is probably a collapse of another one of those large uh, underground caves down in, in uh, Kaibab limestone that's just below the, the level here. I've never hiked down into the hole, but I, I wouldn't doubt that there isn't in some kind of a, of a, of a blowhole somewhere in this system. And uh, you wonder if, if indeed all of this was here when, they, when the Indians occupied the site or whether part of this is constantly moving. Uh, anyway, it's, it's a site that I think uh, the Native Americans must have been intrigued with. I've done a particular study, and this is something that if anybody wishes to download off of the Arizona Geological Survey, if you go to this website, azgs.az.gov, you can download this uh, report on uh, sinkholes in the Sedona area. And sinkholes in archaeology are intriguing to me because uh, some of them were here when, when the Indians occupied this area, and some of them are brand new. Devil's Kitchen, for instance, right north of Sedona, so this is Uptown Sedona. Uptown Sedona is here. This is West Sedona. Uh, Devil's Kitchen first collapsed in the 1880s. And again in 1989, and again in 1995. We have a whole series of them. There's seven of them around the, the town. Uh, every one of these sinkholes is located on fracture zones that are trending to the, to the northwest. And this is out near, this is uh, out beyond 525 heading up toward Palatki. Uh, this has now got a name of, of Dolan uh, Wash. Uh, Turkey Tank Sinkhole. There are some ruins near here. And in between is a, is a, a site near a uh, RV park where some of the pavement collapsed a few years back and the owner, in his infinite wisdom, filled it in. What happens is that uh, with the water table at about this point, the red wall caverns are building up. They're dissolving limestone. And when they get, the caves get too big to support the roof, they collapse upward and they break through. Uh, Devil's Kitchen broke through in historic time. This is a 1983 picture of 
the north wall of Devil's Kitchen. Notice the tree roots up here and the caliche. Uh, this indicates that the rocks have come out of this not too far ahead of 1983. Uh, if you go to 1989, after the no northern third collapse, that's the edge of the picture you just saw right there. On the far wall, that's one of these northwest trending joints. If you get up in an airplane, look down at the country, you'll see all these joints going through the country that help shape the land. It's entirely covered with, with caliche, this calcium carbonate. Uh, you could see this from Airport Mesa, and uh, it looked like a white building off in the distance. Back in 1995, that, that's the white wall you saw, this big chunk landed in behind. This one pivoted out from, from this surface right here. So now you see rainwater is removing material. Now at Devil's Kitchen, I see no sign whatsoever of an archeological site. So this is not known to the Native Americans. And Devil's Kitchen, if you, when I mapped it in 1990, you can see arcuate fractures coming out, clear out to here. So ultimately, this whole thing will be a hole. And all of the Jeeps used to park right here until we made the recommendation that they park up here. You go up to, to Palatki, that's the visitor center. That's the ruins up in the north end of the, of the alcove. Just over this little bank is this giant sinkhole. Again, I think the Native Americans were very cognizant of this feature. Uh, this is a map of the surface. What is fascinating to me is that Red Canyon is draining down here, and it used to flow out here and come out near the parking lot that you park in when you visit Palatki. Uh, a natural flood built a, a small levee here. Water now comes in right into the sinkhole right up to a drain and, it, and the water just disappears right down, right down this hole where it's right there. And right up in here is a blowhole. So you look at a, a longitudinal section and a cross section. Uh, the, the longitudinal section, you can see where water is coming in and draining. If you look at the cross section, you can see all of these, these vertical joints that are helping to control a, a limestone cavern at depth that is dissolving away. That's Phyllis standing near the sinkhole. Hopefully that uh, she, I didn't lose her down the drain. But uh, when, when we have a, a quick meltwater or, and a heavy storm, water will come in and it'll, it'll go down that drain like water going down a bathtub. You can hear it dropping down in the rocks. Notice the pictographs. Now, there's a ledge. They were probably standing here when those pictographs were made. So it could have been that this was the level of the, the bottom of the sinkhole at the time the pictographs were made. Also, straight above the, uh, the, the drain point are these very curious markings that must have been man-made. We saw the same things above V bar B. And I have no idea, I cannot explain them based on any known geological reason why these would be built like this, these, these uh, grooves. But the fact that we see the same thing above V bar V makes me think that there's something special going on that we don't yet understand. Over the blowhole, here are some pictographs. And above, above the blowhole is one of the most amazing pictographs I've ever seen anywhere. There's a rock ledge here and an archer with a drawn bow waiting in ambush for the deer that are coming. And just off the picture over here is another hunter chasing the deer. This is the furthest east or yeah, furthest west sinkhole a bunch of us went down inside and uh, I showed them around. This is a, about a mile west of, of high, 
uh, Road 525 heading up to Palatki. And in the bottom of that, we found some cordage that uh, clearly it indicated that this was occupied by Native Americans. There's another small blowhole. Again, it has no archaeological sites. This is brand new. This is a new sinkhole just beginning to form. Now, where does some of this stuff come from? Uh, this picture you saw earlier, and uh, a lot of points, these old points have been found all over North America. But according to Peter Pillis, the ones that have been found locally are made of local stone. They're not imported from the east. One of the common sources of, of, uh, of chert is coming out of the uh, Kaibab limestone. Some of them have uh, sponge fossils inside of them. This is a chert concretion about six inches in diameter. And as the limestone weathers away, this is a chunk found up uh, in Mark's Draw on the east side of Sedona. You can see the, the, the chert concretion here with a sponge fossil in it and a chunk of limestone that has not yet dissolved away. Cross section of a modern, uh, or modern sponge on the left and the, and the sponge fossil on the right. Between uh, the Palatki and Honanke sites, uh, Jerry Earhart and crew were, were, were checking out some of these small sites. And uh, above it, you see some of the uh, obsidian that's brought in from the plateau, probably as young as a million years or eight million years old. Uh, you find chert's from both the Perkinsville area and, and the Kaibab limestone, and some of the silicified sponge fossils. On the Jerome side of the valley, all of the chert is coming out of the Devonian Martin Dolomite. It looks quite different. You may have heard of the Perkinsville chert. This is on the Perkinsville Road up south of the Verde River. And, uh, this is again a, a variation of the Martin Dolomite where iron oxide is penetrating upward, leaving behind these colored uh, chirts, red, yellow, orange, and so on. And even on the plateau, you may find some rare projectile points made of petrified wood. North of Chino Valley is uh, about a foot thick seam of, of pipestone. It's rather poor quality. It takes a lot of digging to get in anything solid. Those little white spots you see in here are flecks of mica. Uh, pipestone is uh, also called catlinite, and it's a uh, decomposed volcanic ash with an iron oxide flavoring. Some obsidian sites. Basalt obsidian is typically black, while rhyolite obsidian is typically more gray. Uh, several years ago, Ron Krug and a crew of us took this trip up off of Route 66 and came up to Partridge Creek, Presley Wash, and Black Tank obsidian sites. And these are examples, and I'll, I'll give these samples to the, the uh, center so you have them for permanent display, but it shows the different kinds of obsidian coming from different areas. Uh, from Government Mountain, north of I-40, this is a, that classic conchoidal fracture in the black obsidian. It's uh, almost, you can see through it in places. Now stone tools, when you find a piece of quartzite it, out in the Verde Valley where the rocks are soft, that was brought here at a considerable distance. Uh, similarly, up near uh, uh, Bluff, Utah, naturally eroded uh, stream cobbles can be hafted by man to make a, a, an axe head. So a lot of times it isn't just all done, uh, manufactured out of, a, out of a block of rock. They did, they did use things that were, were available. Just at the old Camp Verde 
ranger station, that's uh, Sharon Olson holding a diabase salt pick. And that came from a Precambrian source area way, way to the west of the soft rocks that you find near the salt mine. Just show you a few petroglyphs. You go up into the San Juan area, totally different from what we have locally. Uh, they defy logic. Some of them make sense. They look like birds, uh, like a stork-like animal. But what these represent is anybody's guess. But one of the things that you see that is quite neat are the, 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 the re-digging or re-cutting of, of old panels. You can see the old uh, petroglyphs here. When you have a horse, this is the time of the, uh, the time of the Spanish horse introduced into the North America, even to some gr graffiti up here, AE. So these are built one on top of the other over a long period of time. Look at some of our local petroglyph sites, and you see <clears throat> probably some of the oldest that may go back 10,000 years or so. Typically these scratch marks that Peter Pillis talks about. And handprints where you put your hand up and blow pigment against the hand to leave that impression. One of my favorites in a secret spot up to the north is these ancient bear paw petroglyphs that are almost obliterated by erosion. Beyond uh, Sacred Mountain that you see in the distance is, is a site called the Bigfoot site. And the Bigfoot got its name from this large footprint. And somebody had told me that uh, since they went back here that this has now gone missing, uh, been stolen. I, I can't verify that, but that's what I've been told. But when you look on a vertical face and you see these manganese patinas, manganese oxide, has that kind of a shiny blue-black color. When you dig through that, you see the true color of the stone underneath. And some of the petroglyphs uh, on flat surfaces are being weathered so rapidly. You see some footprints over here. You see uh, petroglyphs that are, that are decomposing. This rock is spalling. And you, you're into enigmatic things. You, you can't really tell whether that's a true one or not. And clearly some of the sites have old repatinated uh, petroglyphs. And you also find rock matates nearby. Uh, Palatki has all kinds of different ages of pictographs to charcoal overlays on top that are probably uh, Navajo that are quite late comers. Red Tank Draw is a very key area, famous uh, for its, its petroglyphs. And some of them are almost so obscure that, that you have to be very observant to see them. You have a lot of lichen covered surfaces. Uh, the Wampus Kitty that is famous, you see it on the logo of the shirts here, uh, it's kind of enigmatic as to what it was, a mountain lion or whatever. But one of the things that intrigues me about that Wampus Kitty, and whoever named it, I, I don't know. But if you go uh, 46 miles to the northwest in, in basalt rock, you see something with similar kind of feet. Uh, it's almost like a look-alike. You can see how these petroglyphs up in here are still preserved. It looks like there was a whole bunch in here that are, that are disappearing. Here we look at, uh, here's Bud looking at some of the petroglyphs near Badger Springs, carved in granite. These are all Precambrian granites, very, very, very hard, not like the sandstones. Now, we we'll talk about a little bit about the uh, solstice sites. And I don't want to uh, upstage Ken here, but uh, this is the famous site, of course, at the V Bar V, where we uh, had a chance to put up that uh, scaffold and look at these up close. If you look at that site, 
these are one meter grids centered on that particular, we just took that as a random point to measure from. But you can see that this big arcuate fracture is uh, causing that block to move outward. And in the process, these stones here, which were part of the bedrock, have moved outward, as you'll see here in a moment. This is the, 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 the center of our grid spacing. But if you look at the grazing light coming through this uh, saddle to the south, you can see these, what we call slick insides, vertical grooves. This was a fault surface that made that vertical wall. And so it's difficult to tell which side went up and which went down. But Ken thinks that some of the stones that were put in here had significant part to play when the sun came through and cast light on the face of the petroglyph panel. This is the uh, scaffold that was put up in uh, 2011. Uh, it's Todd Bostwick uh, looking at the gnomons. These are the two called gnomons, uh, G-N-O-M-O-N. Uh, uh, they cast the shadow down onto the face of the petroglyph panel. And these are natural stones that have moved outward, but instead of falling to the ground, uh, this is rotated outward and, and sticks out now in, in front of that uniform face. That's a, that's a plan view looking down at it. This is a, a side view looking at the face of the cliff. And it's these two stones that make the gnomons that cast the shadow. But when we got up on the scaffold, you could see that there was stones placed in, uh, hard quartzites that you don't find in this area, jammed in there to, to, to keep those rocks from falling. And they've been there for, for a very, very long time and they've done their job. We couldn't see these things from below. There's the two, the two shadows coming down that Ken will talk about when you go up to, to visit. You can see this big natural fracture. And if you look at this piece right in here, that's a very special piece because that was flaked by human hands. A side view of it shows a profile of what Ken thinks to be the profile of the San Francisco peaks, like you would see it from Homalavi or somewhere off to the east. And you'll notice that the, you've got manganese patina on both sides. This has been chipped away. And you can see the percussion point right here where that face was, was purposely manipulated by human hands. There's Ken uh, talking about his, some of the solstice markings. When you go up in the headwaters of the Verde River, uh, this is another site that is quite fascinating. If you look in the distance, you can see one of the Sullivan Buttes. This is a rhyolite plug that sticks up. And when the sun rises, it rises against this face as viewed from a panel over on this side of the cliff. Right up on the edge of the cliff is a, a petroglyph panel. This is a view in the summertime. Uh, exactly what those all signify, I'm not sure. But when you go there on December 21st in a cold morning uh, and you look off and wait for the sun to come up, there it is, rising tangentially right up that slope. So this is a sun washing site. Another one that Ken has worked on. These are cut in basalt. The panel is up in here. Again, with these uh, concentric circles. And uh, Ken has pictures of this, I believe, in his book, uh, where the sun, uh, a rock up above, casts a shadow through here on certain solstice days. On top of, uh, I showed you this before, the, the ruin on top of West Twin Buttes. I climbed up here one morning on, on June 21st to see if there was any, anything 
of archaeological uh, astronomical significance. And to my surprise, looking off, the pinnacle that I'm on is, this is the shadow of, of West Twin Buttes here, but the shadow of East Twin Buttes lands right in the, in the uh, notch of Cathedral Rocks. So the next morning, Phyllis and I went to the saddle, climbed up when the sun is coming up over the horizon, and uh, it lines right up like a giant sundial. And so going up on Munns Mountain, looking back, you can see here's, here's West Twin Buttes, this is East Twin Buttes. You can see we're looking in the direction of the sun right through that notch. So I'm convinced in my own mind that this was something that the Indians would have recognized. So hopefully it gives you a little insight in, in some of our local archaeology related to some geological features. Anybody has any questions, I'll try to answer them. I'm not sure I understood uh, all of the question, but... Well, the, uh, Jared Diamond, uh, University of California, suggests that uh, the early megafauna, the ground sloths and, and others, and mastodons, yeah. mammoths, uh, particularly uh, mastodons, yeah. uh, became extinct because of the depredations of early man yep. in North America. Yep. Uh, others don't hold that view. He seems to have the minority opinion that that, that is the case. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, they, uh, there, I think man had, had something to do with it. You have to remember there was some dramatic climatic changes at that time. We went from the Ice Age into modern time when uh, you, you had a, a major change of weather very, very, rather quickly. We went to, uh, from a cool climate, temperate climate, into a not quite a desert climate like we have today, but uh, Quite, quite a change rapidly. Uh, all of the giant megafauna that was here require long gestation periods. And any animal that is hunted, even peripherally, when you, when you kill off a certain number of, and reduce the population to a certain point, it just catastrophically crashes. I'm convinced in my own mind that man had, had played a good big role in this because there were so many animals went extinct. Animals like the saber-toothed tiger that preyed on these bigger animals, uh, if the bigger animal went down, they did too. Uh, it's, it's a question that cannot be fully uh, answered. One of the things that uh, has been found in recent years is that if you've, if you've heard of uh, the so-called hobbit people in Indonesia, diminutive people that they thought may be a different kind of a race. When you isolate certain populations on islands or isolated locations, they tend to diminish in size. And one of the holdouts of the uh, mammoth was on an island off of uh, Siberian coast. And they think that they lived up until about 4,000 years ago, maybe even younger. And they were diminutive, they were smaller. Uh, so, and they were away from hunting pressure. Uh, I don't know if I, I can fully answer the question, but it's, I, I feel that it was a combination of both man, and perhaps diseases, and a, a radical change of climate that helped push them over the cliff. Yep. Any other questions? The, the test will come next. Thank <laughs> you.